Um, let me go ahead and start recording. Welcome everybody to our CCMP class. I'm going to actually turn off my video and I'm going to share my screen over here to make sure I'm sharing, sharing the right screen. So y'all should be seeing the competitions. Yes. So, okay. Yes. So, um, but yes, yeah, so the question was, uh, do we need folks to start building out uh, labs? Yes, we can definitely do that. Um, the other thing I'm going to do for you, and I've downloaded all of, if folks want to know where the labs are, obviously not. I do want to warn everybody about this. If you don't know what email address is associated with your username on Net, Netacad, you better find out because very soon they're going to change where you have to log in with the email address and password, not your username. So just if you don't know, I'll show you how to find it, by the way. Um, when you log in, just go to your name on the upper right hand corner and go to your profile. Go back over here. I got to go out to actual name. Go to your profile and under your profile, you'll be able to see what your uh, email address is that is associated. But that's coming. So I know we've all been ignoring that item when we log in the Netacad, but be aware you're going to need to know that very soon. But inside of our class, uh, as far as the class content, we know. Let's see, I got a question here from somebody. What we got? Okay, cool. Thank you, Tola. The lab building project, that is excellent. But inside of the class, you know that we don't have a book or we don't have the content in the class itself. We have it in the book. So, but the labs are located here in this content hub. So I'll download and actually I've already downloaded all of them. Um, I'll download all these labs and you'll see that the labs, first one says implementing intervening routing. The next one is, uh, you'll see a a lab on observing spanning tree. So it's literally just three switches. So I would just use three of the iOS uh, layer two switches. Now, again, the big difference is we're not able to use the exact names that are here because of the fact that we don't have those exact nomenclatures for our devices. When we build the lab, the only thing I ask is that when you build it out and, and you change any of these, that you just provide a little change notification, which is what I've done here. If you'll look for our very first lab that we did, um, I just made a little interfaces document. Michael sent it to me and then I just took it and cleaned it up a little bit. So the R1 is connected by G01 to there's the IP address. So whatever I use to replace it, I just fix that in the chart. Um, okay. Can I? Okay. So basically those interface that we see here is the correct one now. Correct. Yep. So let me show you and let me show you exactly what I mean. So I'm going to go in here now and I'm going to actually go in and schedule a lab for myself in our in our CCMP pods. We've got five of them. And if I find that we need more, I can make more. Um, five typically handles a class of this size, but I'm just going to go ahead and click here, give myself a couple hours. All right. Now, what happens again, it takes about three to five minutes for it to boot. So we, we, okay, good question there. Keith said, I'd like to know how to build them, how do I export them from the sandbox? I'll show you how to do that. Uh, in fact, I'll show you how to do it right now when we get in here. It's actually very easy. Um, uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Just a quick one. What's the difference between uh, the labs that um, you got out from Netacad and the packet tracer uh, labs uh, that are also in the resource section of, of Packet Tracer, uh, of Netacard. Uh, are they the same? Uh, let me see what you're talking about here. You're talking about under course resources? Yeah. CCMP Encore? Yeah. Okay, English. So the Packet Tracer files are, let me pull these down here. These are just built yeah, in Packet Tracer. Means... They're just built in Packet Tracer versus being built in, and you know what's going to happen? It's probably going to fail because I've downloaded Packet Tracer 8. Uh, okay. But let me see if it'll boot. Can we use Packet Tracer rather than CML? You can, but I, I just, it, you can. It's just, I don't like it as much. Um, okay. It's it's not the real thing. I mean, it's still 
the the neat thing about CML is it's not a simulation. It's the real iOS. Um, okay. Let me see here. But yeah, here's the. See, here's the difference. See, this lab is even completely different from the lab that's in the class. Now, what, what are we trying to learn here? I mean, here's here's the big thing. What are we trying to learn from this lab is just inner VLAN routing, right? So as long as you understand inner VLAN routing, I'm not going to have a heart attack. But this isn't even the same lab as what's available inside of here. Yeah. So yeah, true. That's 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 the only thing that I would say. It's a it's a more limited, it's a more limited lab, um, as far as the content is trying to do here. Um, okay. It doesn't even have IPv6 on it, which we do know now. And I've told you that inside of uh, actually, I'm impressed that this opened because this is no, it's seven three one. Okay, it must have been at home. I downloaded eight. Whew. Um, but inside of our CML, the devices that are uh, the PCs, they won't support IPv6 right now. So, but log in here to fire, you go to Firefox and this is in the email I sent you. Uh, username is what? It's admin. Password yes. is training, Just... capital T R A I N one N G dollar sign. And this gets you into the uh, lab manager, CML lab manager. Now, you were asking a uh, big question you had, uh, Keisha, was how do I export a lab? Well, first off, if you want to add a lab, you just click add lab. And let's imagine that we were going to build that the next lab in line, which is going to be there's two distributed layer switches. So here and here. And then there's a an access layer switch. OK, and then we're going to do our connection. So we'll say we're going to do um, you just click and drag this line over. And it tells you, so we do gig zero, zero to zero, zero. And, you know, however we decide to do it, we can do zero, one, to zero, one, and then so on and so forth until we do this. Now, once we get this built, we'd go to lab manager. Now we don't want to configure. We want to, we just want to get the connections together, make sure everything's working, go to lab manager, and then you can go to tools and you can export the lab. Um, let's see, where's it at? Oh, where'd it go? Sample labs. Oh, that's not it. Oh, we got to save it. Hold on a minute. Save the lab. It should be in tools. There, maybe. there it is. There it is right there. I had to be inside the lab itself. So you got to go inside the lab itself. I know it was right there. And you do click here and you do download lab. And when you download it, see it, it becomes a YAML file. And so you just save it, and that gives you that file that you could then download. Okay, so there's the YAML file. So I could actually, if I go to Lab Manager now and delete this, and click OK. Oops, I got to delete it. So I'm going to delete this lab. I can import the lab by going and getting that YAML file I just had, which was this right here. Upload the topology, go to the lab, and you'll see here it is. Now, Keisha, your question is once I, you know, I'm in the lab and I save it. So I download it. I go out here and I've downloaded into download. So let's say uh, I'll rename this lab 222 two, two, or whatever. Okay. So I'm going to rename it. But we got a problem because I've got this on a virtual machine that when I end my reservation, what happens to everything in this virtual machine? For me, it goes away. That's it goes I'm away, exactly. Yeah. But guess what? The neat thing is we give you the ability to go to netacad.com. I thought about that, yeah. Okay. So, so I can you just... can go and log in to netacad.com and then just, um, you can actually log in. Okay. The same way that we give you the YAML files, you can upload the YAML files uh, to netacad.com. Um... Oops, I got to put it in right. Now, you may have to use one of your uh, classes that you're an instructor in to do it. Um, but basically, what I could do here is I can go to this class. I can go to files. So I go to files in this class. 
and I go to my download. So right here's the YAML file and I just drag it over and drop it. And now it's saved in netacad.com. And then you could just email it to me. Okay. So that's how, if you want to build your own YAML files and save them, that's how you can do it. And, and you can export them and get them to me and then we'll, we'll trade them around class um, that way. Okay. Now the neat thing, oops, I want to, actually, I didn't want to download it. I just want to delete it. Let's delete that. If you want to do the lab, so for instance, again, I'm in here, I'm in our class. I'm in the lab, I've logged into Netacad. I go to the CCMP class and it's being slow for some reason, but I scroll down and say, okay, here's the YAML file that Kelly wanted me to use for this lab. So I'm gonna click here. You're gonna download it locally, just like I showed you in the video. And then you just import that YAML file. And all the YAML file is, is a uh, yet another markup language file that's showing you how to build the topology. So I can go back to lab manager now. I can import the lab, choose the YAML file that I just downloaded right here, upload it, go to lab, and boom, there's a, there's a pre-built lab topology with everything there. Uh, okay, so basically you are saying that YAML file that you are giving us after downloading, importing into CML, automatically it's gonna build the topology for us? Exactly, yes, sir. Okay, great, yep. great, so great. It's That's already it. built it for you. Now, one of the things you gotta realize is once you import it, you'll notice none of these devices are running right now. Now you could click the green arrow and start each one of them individually. So if you just wanted to start just this one PC, you could click here and that PC will start booting. You can actually see it start to boot up that little green right there. But the easiest way to start, let's say, typically you're gonna to want to start every device in a lab, go to lab manager and just click right here to start lab and it starts every device in the lab. Okay, okay, Jorge, what you got? I like this idea, you know, this is very good, you know, but basically what I did uh, myself, I work on the first two lab and I build them into packet tracer. Basically, okay. I look at the topology and build it there and uh, basically complete the assignment that way, you know, just. That's for... fine. That, that's fine. That's fine. And, and because let's be honest, for the first, for these first five chapters, none of this stuff is honestly, even down through chapter eight, none of this is anything that's going to be super, super new to you. Exactly. Okay. Maybe yeah. some of the maybe some of the advanced spanning tree tuning, but even that's not really that big a deal. It's just how to implement who's your uh, spanning tree uh, primary and secondary and those. So not basically for us, everything down to we get to really advanced OSPF and, and BGP is just taking topics we already know and expanding on them. So if you're exactly. comfortable doing it in Packet Tracer, that's fine. We will have real gear. I'm promising you. They're going to have it. So before the class is over, I'll have the ability for you to do it on real Cisco equipment if you want to. But this is also here as an option um, that we can build out and use. Um, and, and like I said, I just what impresses me the most about this is the fact that it is not a simulation. I mean, it is a true, you know, it's, it's a true iOS. And in fact, this folks, this is how they're doing their CCIE test now. Nobody touches a real piece of gear. They're all using this. They're using CML. When they're doing their their CCIE stuff, so um, so it's 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 a pretty neat little neat little product here. Um, I'm hoping hoping we can get it more widely used because I could easily roll out 20 pods per one fifteen thousand dollar server or more. Um, mm -hmm. oh, we'll see. Yeah. Hello, uh, Kelly. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, um, I have a question. Shoot. More more like um thinking about when I'm going to give this class, because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as you said, they are doing, using the NDG site to, to do the CCIE exams and everything. Um, CML. Back in here, CML. yes, back in here in Panama, um, when we gave these classes, we use the, 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 the actual year to give the CCNP classes. Mm -hmm. And but, that's the idea. Uh, but, but now the institution, you know, everybody is remotely and we don't have access to NDG. I remember when I um, received the class with um, Dan Albergetti and yep. he told us that the, the access for the NDG is uh, 
Uh, we have to pay a fee for every student. Can can you talk about uh, this? Be because that, here, depend, that was that that was for your cyber ops class, correct? Yes, but in the cyber ops, we use uh, virtual machines. Uh, right, right. With, with the with with the the last version. Right. With with our what we're doing, NetLabs does not even offer access to real Cisco gear. That is not something they sell at all. Um, this is our gear on our campus. We, we actually have a huge data center. Well, it's not huge, but it's huge by the standards of most people. We run a data center that supports our classes that, and I'm actually the data center manager, that's bigger than the data center that runs our entire campus. Um, we probably have 35 servers. We have 16 pods of real Cisco equipment that are sitting in, in, the, in the labs. Um, we can talk about getting you some access for your students to be able to, to use some net labs okay i'm sharing access right now with schools especially schools that don't have equipment or are not meeting in person i'm doing the best i can to try to share with those schools during this COVID outbreak um, we you're right there's no current way to buy access to equipment um, we are working on a system of charging 35 dollars per student per class um, but right now I'm not even charging. I'm, I'm allowing, giving as much access as I can to different students. Um, for you, honestly, the idea was gonna be you get back in person and you're able to teach using your real gear. In the meantime, if you're gonna be running a CCMP class and you don't have a hundred students, I can't support a hundred students, but we can talk about trying to get you access possibly to the CML that we have here or getting you access to our real gear to help you out. Um, but you're right. If, if you're going to be teaching CCMP, the ideal thing is you're in the seated classroom, you have access to the real gear, or you have access to NetLabs, and they're hopefully going to get the CCMP pods out soon. The problem is what people don't realize, not many people are even teaching CCMP. You know, there, there's, there are very few schools that teach CCMP at all. Um, in yes, fact, that's I'm, right. I'm very that's shocked right. at the number of folks who took this class because um, I was, I didn't expect to have the, I honestly wanted to limit it to just 10 people, but the more and more people wanted to get in, I said, well, I'll, I'll run it. Um, but very few people actually teach CCMP. I think this is good for you, even if you're not going to teach it, because it will give you an expanded view of your CCNA offerings and what you do there. Um, but again, it, it's just not as clean. It's not as clean a class as our CCNA. Um, I had a, also had a quick question from Keisha. She said, are we assigned IPv6 addresses to the PCs? No, we do not uh, because the PCs do not support IPv6 addresses. In fact, with these, uh, with the PCs, since they are um, Linux boxes, you're going to have to use Linux commands to put IP addresses on them. Okay. Just remember, anytime you go into a device, typically if you need to know what, a, need a password, the password is just Cisco, all lowercase. All right. So, and I typed it in wrong. I know I did one. That's Cisco all lowercase. Well, Andrew, that's a good point. Maybe it's not being offered because not many people offer it. You're talking about instructor training or just the class itself. Yeah, you could do that. You could definitely do that, Andrew. If you wanted to to make a router uh, be one of the uh, one of the PCs, you could do that. There's no reason you couldn't do that. It may use a little bit more resources, uh, but if you wanted to do that, you could just go in here. And um, you can change the actual uh, pod itself. You are build, or you could, yeah, you could delete the link here, and you could put you in another one. Or if you wanted to, um, you could actually go in and, and create a new lab and just build it out the way you, you know. You can add. You actually could just add nodes here. So you could go in here and say, okay, I'm going to put in an ISV, and uh, I suppose we connected to Gig02. So I'm just going to go right here, and I'm going to delete this link. And then I'll take this and connect it to you know, wherever. And so, yes, you could do that if you wanted to. Okay, there, uh, thank you, Jared, for sending static and IP v4 addresses. Um, the problem with that particular document, the only problem is that uh, the PCs, these Linux boxes, is a known issue, will not support um, will not support the commands to allow you to put IPv6 on it. This is an Alpine Linux, I believe it is. It's a little Alpine Linux. It's a basically a little nothing. I hadn't tried the Ubuntu 
Um, we could also look at it and see, but I've just, oh, you got it to work? You did, oh, okay. Huh, all right. Well, I have to look at your, uh, everybody look at these directions. Well, I was going to ask because I was up all, all night doing my lab and that was the only thing I did not get done. Um, but of course it was assigned via Slack. So I, I was going to ask you if I could complete, turn my lab in as completed. Pseudo mod pro IPv6. Okay, I'm going to put this document. Thank you very much, Jared. I'll put this document into our... Um, Yeah, so you statically assign the addresses. Okay, let me, I'll put this document into uh, into our uh, thing. Thank you very much. I, you learn something every day. I told somebody in the last class that uh, that's one of the things I'm, I really enjoy about teaching in a seated environment is I learned so much from my other instructors. And so it's really nice to be able to learn from y'all. Very nice to be able to learn from everybody because I am by no means a uh, Linux guru. So let me go back now and I will give you the commands. And so this will hold true for our add -in. So Did this add -in. document use VI to edit the Etsy network interfaces? Okay. And here's the documentation. So it's saying basically you enable IPv6 by doing the mod probe IPv6. And then you edit that Etsy interfaces file using BI or uh, you also, I think Nano's installed. You can use either one, but that's, and then restart your network and you'll be able to do it. So very good. That's one way. I also had a way to do it directly from the command line. Um, but I didn't have a way to do, I couldn't get the IPv6 to work. So excellent, that's good to know. So we can do this anytime we're using that little Alpine Linux. I'll try this again with VI, but I, I thought I tried it and somehow it didn't allow me to. It may not, it may, VI may be the only thing that's on there depending on that particular little, little version. But excellent, that's good to know, thank you. Very, very good. All right. Questions about our Set up. Turn this thing off. Real quickly, which type of um, switches did you use for the yeah, layer no three one. switches? Is it the 900 Nexus switches? No, no, I just use the iOS layer three L2. They will actually work. You can actually do a no switch port on them. So they will work. And you, I'm okay, that one I was trying to, okay. Yeah. Okay. The, no uh, the other one is it's got so much junk on it um, that it, it it takes a long time to boot and it it becomes an issue. So I would definitely suggest just this iOS L2. It will work. Okay. Other questions there. The other thing I want to make sure you're very clear on um, is don't forget that your book is free and available through the library. So you go to library, you go to resources, A to Z database, and then go to O'Reilly. Now, occasionally if you leave the, like leave it open and you're logged in for a while, it actually end up kind of logging you into a weird little area where it says you don't have access. But as long as you put in your Stanley email address, which you all have a Stanley email address and do let's go, you should get access to our system and you have here again the book for ccp encore right here the cert guide and you have a complete video course so if you want to you know you want to watch videos on certain topics they are there too so you can actually use this video course and be re watching those in addition um, i want to just kind of touch on are there any questions i don't really think there'd be very many questions on the first couple items or the first couple of chapters because of the fact that it's just stuff we pretty much are already familiar with. But any questions about inter VLAN routing? I will tell you, I was, I've been very shocked by the fact that the 1000V, I could not get it to do inter VLAN routing. Um, and it's an, a known issue. You can set it up and it looks like it should work, 
but for some reason it's not doing the inter VLAN routing um, because it's not tagging the uh, the interfaces. But that's the only reason I'm using this IOSV is because it does support inter VLAN routing. But you know to build yourself a sub interface and then uh, ensure that those sub interfaces are um, are being routed. But like I said, here's the whole book. Everything's here. Um, going forward till we got it forwarding stuff. There is a do you know it quiz, so you can actually take this if you want to take these before each one. And then as you're reading through, oh, wrong one. Got to go back one. chapter one. So any questions on packet forwarding on layer two collision domains? Again, all of this is stuff that's inside of Netacad and inside of CCNA already. Virtual lands, they get a little more in depth into it, talking about 8021Qs uh, packets or dot one q probably heard it referred to as dot one q packets, but that's just the Tag, it, uh, tag protocol identifier, the header that's being placed in to give you your VLAN ID. Down at the bottom here, your VLAN ID, which is 12-bit identifier, talks about the reserved VLANs, VLAN 1, then VLAN 2 to 1001, and then above uh, 1006 to 4094 are extended, and these can be um, added and changed. So we, we've worked mainly with the what, 2 to 1001, and we've not had to create many above here because very few of us build more than a thousand VLANs. But you see the process here, pretty much simple, same as always. One problem you will see is if you don't exit the, the config VLAN uh, on a real switch, it's not being created. So let me see if I can actually show you that. That's something that gets people in trouble sometimes. So let's see if I can let's see if these things act right, which they should. Okay, so I'm doing config T. Let's do host S1 or D1. D1. Oh, poop. I did D2. Host D1. Okay. D1, not exclamation point. Okay. So now what I want to do is I'm going to create a VLAN. So I'm going to do uh, VLAN 10. You'll notice it says config VLAN name. Um, Let's just do faculty. Okay. What actually happens if you do a do show VLAN right now, you will see there's no VLAN 10 yet. And so people get in trouble sometimes, and, and especially with uh, Packet Tracer, because when you do this in Packet Tracer, if you do VLAN 10, it automatically puts it into the, um, the VLAN.dat. But in the real world, you have to actually exit config VLAN for it to get written to the VLAN.dat. And then now you'll see that there is a VLAN 10 faculty, which was not here before. So be aware when you're in sub configuration mode for a VLAN, so VLAN 20, name management, until you actually exit out of that, the VLAN is not created. And also remember, each time you create VLANs, creating the VLAN is only half of the equation. The other portion is placing ports into the, the correct VLAN. And that's where you'll have to figure out which one of these is connected where. So, and that's all part of our documentation. But that is pretty much just basic VLAN configuration. I've seen people get in trouble, especially with Packet Tracer, uh, with this particular item. It, it, Packet Tracer doesn't work the way real devices do. Also remember if you do a do uh, show flash colon, oops, do show flash colon, you should see inside of here somewhere should be a VLAN.dat. There's a whole lot of stuff in here because of all the stuff that gets loaded with this iOS. So I can find the VLAN.dat. all grub stuff. Let's see. Maybe it's still showing stuff. There it went. 
There's NB RAM. Let's do a control Z. Show. Ah. Shift control six X. Doesn't work on this. I had to let it time out. Control shift six, I think. Yeah, I've tried it. it it's not working inside oh, of this. Yeah, this is. Yeah, because it's inside of this, inside of NetLabs, it's not actually taking the, you know, normal control, it's normal as control shift six X. Yeah. The, the command is login synchronous. Uh, no, no IP problem. domain lookup. Uh, no IP domain lookup. Thank you. Yeah, I should, that's what I needed to do. And let me do is no IP yeah. domain dash lookup. Lookup. And then now I won't have that problem. But also, you're right. Uh, it also is a good idea to always do line con zero and do uh, logging synchronous. That way you'll get, uh, it won't overwrite your commands as you're, yeah, like that. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, show flash or dir flash. Let's do it. Okay, so it's not showing a uh, not showing a VLAN dot that. Okay, the boot boot flash, by the way, is what's used with the new 40, uh, 4000 series routers, not just flash, it's boot flash. Okay, well, it's not storing it in that. Must be stored in NVRAM or config.grub instead of inside of the uh, set inside of VLAN. Dot dat. Let me do a write. Let me do a. Everyone knows write is short for um, copy run start. Okay, so there's the there's the actual startup file for it. So it, it will save it, but it's not saving it in a VLAN.dat. So there's one difference we have found with uh, CML versus regular gear. But you can create VLANs and you can add you can add uh, ports to the VLAN. So that's as far as the functionality, you can do it, no problem. Questions on those? Okay. How many of you read any of the book yet? Had a chance to read any? Anybody you can raise your hands or say no. Use right me. I yet. read the first four chapters, yes. Wow, somebody read the first eight chapters. Yeah. Somebody, that's crazy. That's yeah. insane. That's pretty good. We're all eager to go. You're dead. You're definitely eager to go. Most definitely. Um tell me this. True false. Trunk ports uh maintain VLAN tags. Comport? Trunk ports. Oh, maintain trunk. VLAN tags. True, fault. You might want Keisha oh. saying false. I, th I was on mute. I, th I thought you guys could hear me, but <laughs> so trunk trunk ports. If I put a, a port into trunk mode, it will maintain the VLAN tags. True or false? When you say maintain, are you meaning like, is it going to be assigned to a VLAN or just? And, and if VLAN traffic comes to a trunk port, yes. the tag oh. will not be stripped out of the frame. Oh, I just read that. True. Um, that is true. Yeah. That is true. So the purpose of a trunk you know, port. You know what, Kelly? Yes. Everybody was looking for the trick in the question. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there, there was no trick. I, I wasn't trying to trick you. No. Remember that trunk ports maintain tags for all VLANs except for the native VLAN that is defined on the trunk port. Yeah. Okay. And the default native VLAN is always one. One by default. Okay. Which, by the way, you should normally on your trunks for uh, security reasons change it to a non-existent VLAN to be your your native VLAN. That way you don't just make sure it's the same on both sides as long as it is. Um, you won't get any error messages, but you don't want to actually let native VLAN be one. That's that's not a good idea. And the whole native VLAN thing is crazy because it's a legacy item that is there only because you can't guarantee that there's not other host on a trunk link. Um, we do. We know there's no other host on a trunk link, but back in the old days, they had to have the ability to allow it. So 
The other item is our allowed VLANs. Remember, this is how we control what VLANs are allowed to go across the trunk. Um, by default, all VLANs are allowed across the trunk. Remember, this is the only place you can really get in trouble is if you imagine you have a large network and really for security reasons, you should only allow certain VLANs across your trunks. But if you add a VLAN that needs to cross a lot of different switches, you're then gonna have to go to each one of those switches or maybe you'll be able to use network automation to be able to uh, allow other VLANs. And Andrew says, if you're using .1Q, yes. And .1Q is the main uh, tagging protocol used today. There used to be an older one called ISL. And in fact, uh, these switches do support ISL trunking. Um, some of the older switches do. So be aware there is .1Q and there's ISL. Most of it, most of what we deal with will be dealing with ISL, or excuse me, .1Q because ISL is a legacy um, protocol. All right, well, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here though. Questions about the port statuses? Any questions about layer 3 forwarding as far as our packet routing? Looking at, um, one, one question I always want you to be aware of, one question I want you to always think about is this. Anytime a packet is routed by a router, the longest match in the routing table is the one that is used. So look, you always look for your longest match and that is the one that's used as long as you're using, um, you're not using class full routing, using class list. And almost everything is now class list. So it'd be the longest match. Here's something you've probably never seen or never really played with. It is possible to put two IP addresses onto an interface by using a command called secondary, two IPv4 addresses. Um, IPv6, you can put multiple addresses or multiple uh, IPv6 addresses on any interface because it's designed to be set up that way. But for IPv4, uh, the command is the second IP address you want, secondary and allows, allows you to put a secondary IP address. It's very rare that we do that. It's just one of those special case uh, points that we use. Here's our dot one Q for our sub interfaces, our routed sub interfaces, which is exactly what the lab has us doing. Or we could do, if you have a switch that supports switch virtual interfaces, SVIs, you can create the SVIs and the VLANs and you can use SVIs to route. Again, part of what we've already done. This, however, is something you have never done before. Not many routers support it, but in our setup, exactly what you see here, because the route or the, the um, connection between this switch and the router is actually a network. So this is a routed port right here. So when I click here, you'll see that gigabit 01 on D1 needs to be, instead of a switch port, it needs to be a routed port. So let's go into this switch and let's look, it was gig01. Make sure I got that right. Yep, gig01. So we're going to go in here and we're going to go config t int gig01. And if I try to put an IP address on it, it's going to even, it's going to say that that command is not known. You can't do it. But if I put in no switch port, okay, this is now a routed port. So I can put in an IP address on it. Okay, I can have it get an IP address via DHCP. This is not something we've done before. This was on, I interviewed to work for an ISP and one of the first things they asked me is how do you turn a switched port into a routed port? And the command is simple. If the iOS on the switch supports it, you put no switch port and now you can put an IP address on that particular port and you can do a no shutdown and you can have routing, a routed port between these two. So this is not a switch port anymore, it's a routed port. So I'd have to put an IP address on this side. So let's just, I'm gonna use nothing that's in the lab folks. This is just me putting in an IP address, um, but 255.255.255.0. I'm doing no shut. I cannot type today folks. I'm gonna go back to my router over here to gig01. So I'm going to my router, config T. And since I'm not typing well, I'm gonna do no IP domain. 
dash lookup. I'm going to do line con zero logging synchronous just to make sure I got all that down. Then I'm going to do int gi01. Okay. And I'm going to put IP address 192.168.12.1255255. Oops. Dot two five five dot zero. I used to type a whole lot faster before I got hit by a truck. No shut. And now what I should be able to do is I should be able to ping ping one nine two dot one six eight dot twelve dot two. Eventually it should come up and work. There we go. And so I have between this R one and this D one, I've created a routed network right here. I've got the 12.0 slash 24 network that is available because I turn the switch port into a routed port. And vice versa here, I can do a, I want to ping the PC just to, or the router just to prove that I am not lying to you. 68.12.1, which is our router port. There we have pingage. So you can see I turned the port into a routed port. Questions about that? None? All right. Uh, have, um, nope, go ahead. Questions. I was just had one question. When you said we never seen this before, what do you mean by that? Uh, it's not something they teach in CCNA really. Okay, because I was like, we teach, well, it's in version six and seven. It's, it's um, mentioned one time, but you don't ever do a lab on it. Oh, it's, I mean, I, it's, it's mentioned like in one little paragraph, but they don't really explain yeah. what they're really trying to do. Um, they just say, oh, you can do this, but you don't really use it in the lab. We actually use it in the lab in this class. So okay, we're, we're just expanding created, on it. Yeah, I've created labs and teach that concept. So I was just trying to figure out if we were, if I was doing too much. Okay. No, no that's, that's, that's all it is. Somebody else have a question? Uh, I just wanted to comment uh, two things that happens with my students. Um, I just wanted to share with the other instructors. Um, first of all, when they are creating the interface VLAN before that the, the student goes interface VLAN, put the IP address, they always forget to put no shutdown. Yep. The student don't, don't, you know, don't turn on the, the interface after the interface VLAN. So, so that's something that you always have to be careful. And the other thing is about the IP address and the IPv6 IPv6 address. Do you know? You know that if you put a second IPv6 address, he, uh, the the switch or the address or the or the router will add it to the interface. And with the IPv4, it will change it. So, so that's a different uh, behavior correct. with the IP address and the IPv6, just to share that with That is correct. Other. Now, I will say this. If you use this secondary command, it adds a second IPv4 address. It doesn't overwrite the original. So, correct, correct. But you're right. If you just put IP address and then you were to put the IP address again without the secondary, it overwrites. Anytime with IPv6, it just adds that new address to it. And you're right, students get in trouble with that because they end up putting five or six IPv6, the incorrect IPv6 addresses onto an interface thinking they're overriding it when they're just adding it to the interface. Very good points, excellent points. I'll be honest with you, I, many times I forgot to do a no shutdown on, on interfaces. I, I still do it to this day, which is why I really like this command show IP at brief because it tells you exactly whether or not it's up or down. And that way you can see that you whether or not you've turned it on. So one of my favorite commands is show IP interface brief. Um, yeah, it, it is. It is also one of my favorites, but it doesn't work with packet tracer. So that's unfortunate. It works, but doesn't work well. Yeah, it doesn't work as well as it does with 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 real gear. So show IPv6 interface brief. Same thing. It just shows you the IPv6 addresses that are assigned. So. Questions on that? We have already discussed the differences between process switched in terms of what we did before. So process switched is involving the, um, basically involving the process every single time that you have to uh, complete a, um, 
a, a lookup. So process switching or software or slow path, it's used for general purpose, uh, um, general purpose CPUs. So it's it's not a very fast way of doing um, our, our routing because we have to look it up every single time a packet comes in. If we have Ceph or express forwarding, we actually have the ability to build a, a forwarding uh, table. And instead of having to do this process switching to where we're going in and we're having to look every single time with every packet that comes in, we actually have a table. And when the first one that's figured out how we're gonna use it from then on, every other packet that's going the same way, we'll just use the, the Ceph table which is very important. Now, if it's not in the Ceph table, here's something important. If an ingress packet is not in the Ceph table, it gets punted over to the be process switched. So you have to do a full lookup and then it will go out the egress. So anything not in the Ceph table does have to invoke this process switching. Our goal is to get a FIB or a, our entire, basically our, uh, our express database that has all possible routes in it already produced and created so that any ingress packet will not get punted over to the CPU. Anything we can keep out of the CPU, the faster the router is at being able to, um, being able to send it out an egress port. Questions about that? And then we're talking about, these are the 14 engines on a switch looking at having different types of forwarding engines, distributed versus centralized. So you can have a centralized forwarding engine or you can have distributed forwarding engines that are out on uh, particular line cards. This is more important when you get into large, um, large switches that have line cards. And so you're trying to put some of the forwarding uh, mechanisms out on the line cards. Um, so like on our, the 9000 series switches used to be the 6800 and 6500, 6600, 65 and 6800 series switches. But this is the difference between having one centralized forwarding versus having it out on the, the actual line cards. So here we have Ceph. This is software Ceph. So we're creating a forwarding information base that has the next top addresses. So we have a FIB and adjacency table so that we can literally just have it come in and we don't have to do a lookup. We don't have to punt it over to the CPU. We just look at the forwarding table and we have an adjacency table to make sure we can send it back out as quick as possible. This keeps it from being processed by the CPU. If they have to be processed by the CPU, that is a huge performance hit for any router. It really hurts a router to have to pump things over to the um, over to the CPU. And then the best thing is this hardware Ceph, which is where we have ASICs that are doing building the Ceph tables and are able to do it in hardware instead of in software. Okay, we've done some of the different this that's SDM templates where we can change it to allow for both IPv6 and IPv4. So we can change the templates on different devices, depending on whether or not it's a um, Cisco 20, uh, 9000 all the way up, they'd still use the same command SDM prefer, and then you can tell it what SDM you prefer, and then you have to reload it for it to take effect. You've used this already inside of CCNA. You can show the SDM prefer to see what is allowed. And that folks is all of chapter one. Questions about chapter one. Okay. Questions about the CML interface and CML itself. One question. Shoot. Go ahead. How do I add? Because I'm building the lab for number two. How do I add the links? Okay. Between the um, network devices. Here's what you do. So I've got a lab here. Mm -hmm. And so you want to connect this switch to this switch. Yes. You click on the blue link. Right. Drag it to the other device. Oh, cool. And then it will pull up the list of ports that are available. So if you could go gig zero two to gig zero two, and then same if it's got dual links, you just pull it again and you can do zero three to zero three or whatever. Perfect. And so now you can see there's multiple links in here. 
And if you click on it, it will actually show you. Here's the neat thing. It will show you what's connected on each side if you click on the link. So you just literally just grab the, the blue line, pull it, and then pick your interfaces you want to use. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And there you go. And so there you and you'll be able to see what's what all is connected. So it's really, really pretty simple. It's really just like Packet Tracer. Um, it's just using a real iOS image instead of Packet Tracer, instead of Packet Tracer. And if you want to boot one of these devices inside of here, just click the, the green arrow and that boots it. Mm -hmm. So be aware if any of you are trying to mess with it and you can't get into it, it's probably not booted. So just don't forget, just boot it. I will tell you if you get too many devices booted, uh, like right now we've got what, nine, 12 devices booted. Um, you see our CPU starting to be used a little bit, um, but I, you should be able to probably boot up to 20 devices at a time and not have too many problems with uh, CPU load. Um, and it may bounce way up and then come back down, but you can build you can build some pretty big labs inside of here. Okay. All right, folks. Um, that's all I'm going to go over tonight. I think, uh, so Tolu, you want to hang, uh, hang out? Um, I'll tell you what I'll do. Actually, I'll start us another meeting and invite you in uh, after this meeting's over so that I can be processing the... Uh, the actual recording file for this particular meeting. And then uh, that way we can meet. So I'll send you one right after this is over. Um, and okay, we will, thanks. We will go from there. Uh, any questions? I want you to continue reading, continue working on the first five chapters. I think if I'm not mistaken, we have, I pushed the due dates out a while because I knew it would take us a while to get everything started and going. Um, so your first couple labs are due on the, on the 14th, which is this weekend. And then the chapter five labs are not due to the 21st. Now, feel free to work ahead if you want to. Um, just be aware that it's uh, that's that's the schedule we're on right now so we can get everybody uh, comfortable with the system. And also, what I'm trying to do is push things back far enough that hopefully in the next week or so, I'll have the real gear set up too, so you'll have it. Any other questions? By the way, it's awesome to have all 14 of you in here today. That is an amazing number of people out of the number of folks that are in the class. So I cannot thank you enough for being in here. Um, and I'm really excited to have everybody using and, and banging on the CML system and playing with it and, and getting us some good feedback on it because I'm trying my best to get it to be something that we can use um, consistently for, for our, especially for CCMP classes. I have yeah, one we're... last question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, I think you talked about this last week, but um, when we upload our labs, like our first lab didn't have any questions. Right. Um, so I just uploaded the snippets. I created documents of the snippets. What exactly would That's you fine. like us to upload? That's fine. If there are no questions, just give me, get, what I'd like to have really is you can do some snips or uh, also just give me your completed configuration files. So just do it, you know, just go in here and do a show run and then show me and then do snips of it. Okay, because I was trying, now that you showed us, so we will have to open up net, like a notepad within the MVG, save it. Yeah, and you can go in here and actually there's a, I believe there's a notepad. There should be uh, under accessories here. There should be a little notepad, yeah. Uh, and wow. upload it to our Netacad in in, um, in the lab. Yeah. Oops. And, and you should be able to like, um, in show run. Don't know if this will work, but we'll see. We'll try. I'm just going to grab something out of here. Copy. Should work. And you go to his. Yep. It's patient. So you just do a show run and then select your entire you know, config here. Copy it. And you could dump it into a mouse pad, which is just like a little notepad. And then if you want to save it and, and upload it or just take a picture of it, either way would be fine. But that's, that, that allows me to see that you've been, really the big thing is, I just wanna see that you're working in the labs. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to be too stringent because I want you to be able to teach this class and feel comfortable. That's the big thing. I want you to, to feel comfortable with, with the materials when you get to teaching it. So, all right, any other questions?
All right, I am going to stop sharing. I'm going to stop my recording.